Around the world, nine million criminals behind bars. Armed robbers, rapists, and murderers. Most surrender to incarceration, but some fight back and escape. Tonight, the peaceful countryside of Ireland is shattered by an armed breakout. This was an audacious, um, violent, vicious attack. In Australia, one of the most infamous prison breaks ever staged. Why not? You know, what did you have to lose? 12 years was a long time for a, you know, a 22, 23-year-old bloke. And in America, a bizarre escape plan hangs from a rope made of dental floss. I said, he moves, blow his brains out. This program contains reconstructions. The prison breaks are real. Her Majesty's Prison Pentridge, 1965. A maximum security facility in the heart of Melbourne, Victoria. The state's oldest and toughest prison. Inside its blue stone walls, Victoria's most notorious and dangerous criminals. 1,500 inmates held in cramped 3 metre by 1.9 metre cells, watched by 250 guards. It was a cold, hard place and the system in the early days was very tough. Inside B Division, 40-year-old Ronald Joseph Ryan, a career criminal convicted of robbery and safe blowings. Sentence, eight years. A violent and impoverished childhood, his life of crime began early. Essentially, he had a criminal personality. He'd uh, committed offences from the age of 11. He wasn't happy because he was doing uh, eight-year threats. And uh, he had to sort of get his mind around that. And uh, didn't mix with many prisoners. To make matters worse, his latest stint in jail cost him his family. Dorothy had had enough by then. She didn't want this kind of life to affect the, the raising of the girls. Desperate to win his family back, Ryan is determined to escape. And, knowing that he needs an accomplice, he approaches fellow prisoner, Peter Walker. I think we just came out one day while talking, you know, just, um, what do you think about having to go getting out? And being young and full of vigour in them days, so sort of, uh, yeah, why not? At 23, Peter John Walker was a violent criminal, convicted of armed robbery and shooting with intent to cause grievous bodily harm. Peter Walker was not a very nice prisoner. He was in love with himself. If there was a mirror, he'd be looking at it all day. Very fit, uh, somewhat aggressive. Ryan and Walker constructed an escape plan. Actually, we were sitting in the yard and Ronnie pointed up at the town. He said, what do you think about going through there? And I looked up and all I could see was this guard standing on top of a tower. And I said to him, she's a bit bloody rude, you know, going through there. And he said, well, take a look at it and what do you think? And over the, a few weeks, looking at it, it looked feasible. You know, it could be done. Just before 2pm on the 19th of December 1965, the 1,500 inmates were being watched by a skeleton staff. It was the day of the prison officer's annual Christmas lunch. What happened next would shock the nation. Cork Prison, Ireland, 2001. Built as an army barracks in 1805, inmates with notions of escape know it's a tough nut to crack. Locked inside are some of the most dangerous and violent prisoners in Ireland. Among them, 29-year-old Adrian Duke. A career criminal since his teens, Duke is now facing charges for armed robbery. He was known to have a propensity towards violence. Um, and uh, he was regarded as being a serious criminal in Cork City. Expecting a hefty jail sentence, Duke has no intention of spending his life in a cramped cell. You're talking about 10 years plus. There's no question about it, his motivation would have been to avoid a lengthy jail sentence. Unable to find a weak spot inside this barred fortress, Duke is forced to look further afield and comes up with a plan. He is soon to travel to Waterford, 65 miles away to face additional burglary charges. And to get to his trial, 
He'll be outside the prison walls for a whole day. He would have been transported by uh, in a private van that would have been hired by the prison services, Cork Prison Services, to take him from Cork City to Waterford and whatever the outcome was then, he would have still have been uh, returning back to uh, Cork Prison. Duke calculates that his only chance of escape is during the journey and any kind of ambush will require some serious manpower. We believe it was a joint enterprise between a Waterford-based criminal gang and a Cork City-based criminal gang. And we believe that their associations emanated from their time in prison together in Cork. Under the surface of picture postcards, Southern Ireland is a network of criminal gangs. Duke calls in a favor. At 8 a.m. on February the 1st, Duke is transported from Cork Prison to Waterford Court to face the burglary charges. Other countries move felons in specially designed escape-proof vehicles. But in 21st century Ireland, they still use hired minibuses and unarmed guards. In court, the victim refuses to testify and Duke's Waterford case is dropped. At 5.30 p.m., the van with Duke and one other prisoner leaves on its return journey to Cork. Adrian Duke was handcuffed to uh, one of the prison officers in that van. It's a regular trip. The prison officers have done it dozens of times. An easy hour and a half's drive. There was no specific threat that Adrian Duke was armed or was going to become armed or was going to escape. So given those circumstances, the prison staff uh, would not be armed and they wouldn't have a police escort in relation to the actual movement of the prisoner. At 5.45 p.m., only five miles out from Waterford, the van is driving down an isolated country road. Unarmed and unaware, the prison officers have no idea of what is about to hit them. Three masked gunmen have carefully plotted the prison van's route and know this is the best place for an ambush. Forcing the van to pull over, the thugs leap into action. an audacious, um, violent, vicious attack. The terrified guards know these armed and dangerous attackers will stop at nothing to free their man. Coming up, a resourceful inmate makes an extraordinary escape tool. Yeah, this requires you have dental care for inmates and that day was provided dental floss. And Ryan and Walker's disastrous escape bid. When prisoners are escaping, nothing gets in their way. South Central Regional Jail, Charleston, West Virginia, 1994. A brand new multi-million dollar state-of-the-art detention center. Behind these walls, a sophisticated monitoring system watches over more than 300 hardened criminals. Well, this would basically be described as a medium security facility. The building is actually designed to be the perimeter, and if you can breach the, uh, the building, then you do have a fair chance at escaping. In its first year of operation, South Central's record was perfect. No escapes. But one man is going to change all that. Robert Dale Shepard is a career criminal, convicted for a string of armed robberies, sentenced to life. A fairly intelligent person. Uh, he was uh, manipulative, somewhat arrogant. He had been charged with several different crimes. He had been convicted of several different crimes. He was a drug addict and mostly pain pills, but he did everything else probably at one time or another. Shepard had spent most of his adult life behind bars. He knows the system inside out. Inmates, whether it's in a jail or a prison, uh, have nothing but time on their hands, while our correctional staff uh, have duties to perform. Shepard is no stranger to violence. He had killed a fellow inmate by kicking him in the head. And with his life sentence, he has nothing to lose. He creates an ingenious plan that defies belief. 
he discovered that the wall surrounding the recreation yard was also the outer wall of the jail. And instead of razor wire or bars, the roof is only covered with a simple mesh. The rec yard's about 20 feet high. It's a cinder block wall, if you will. It's like a room in the building, and it doesn't have a roof on it. But I had this chain-link fence, and there was no Constantina or razor wire around that rec yard at that time to top of that fence. So he recognized that as a weakness. Shepard works out. If he can get to the top of the wall and cut through the mesh roof, then only a small perimeter fence stands between him and freedom. The first part of his plan is to approach another inmate. The pair make an extraordinary deal. He actually uh, arranged to assault an inmate and stab him uh, so that he would be put into disciplinary confinement. And without a second thought, Shepard stabs his fellow prisoner. It's just a flesh wound, but it's enough to get Shepard thrown exactly where he wants to be, in solitary confinement. He discovered you don't interact with the other population. So if you're going to have, for example, outdoor recreation, you would be at outdoor recreation by yourself after hours and not with other inmates. As planned, Shepard now has the entire rec yard to himself for one whole hour of every evening. Shepard knows that if he stands directly under one of the rec yard cameras, no one can see him. He's found a blind spot in the jail security system. The cameras at that time in the rec yard uh, were not pan and tilt. They didn't have zoom. Consequently, they covered about 65% of the rec yard. Shepard's next challenge is to find a way to scale the six meter wall so he can attack the mesh. His first thought is an obvious one, a rope. His second is a stroke of genius, dental floss. A breakout that will horrify the American prison system with its simplicity. Her Majesty's Prison, Pentridge, Australia. Violent armed robbers, Ronald Ryan and Peter Walker, are planning to escape over the blue stone walls. You, why not? You know, what did you have to lose? 12 years was a long time for a, you know, a 22, 23-year-old bloke. On December the 19th, 1965, Ryan and Walker are ready. Unsupervised in exercise yard B and using socks on their hands to protect them from the barbed wire on top, the two prisoners hurl themselves up and over the wall. But they aren't out yet. The next challenge is an even higher second blue stone wall, over five meters tall. Above, Warder Helmut Langer is on duty in guard tower number one post. Ryan and Walker pull bed sheets from beneath their clothes. Attaching the sheets to a hook they'd fashioned from scrap metal, they throw their grappling iron over pipes at the top of the wall. Silently, they begin their five meter climb to freedom. There would have been a great amount of uh, fear and uh, bravado, I guess. To distract Officer Langer, an accomplice in the yard creates a diversion at the critical moment. When he turns around, Langer comes face to face with Ryan and Walker. Hands up now, I'm serious. Keep Ryan up. grabs Langer's rifle and orders him to pull the lever, which will open the gate below. Horrifying. It's a terrible situation for him to be in. When someone's got a rifle pointing at you. Uh, is he going to pull the trigger or is he not? You say to yourself, this is it, I'm gone. Get down! Ryan and Walker force Helmut Langer down to the outside gate at gunpoint. Come on, keep it going! Open the door. Open it. But it's a trick. You the wrong lever! Bravely, Langer has pulled the wrong lever. The gate is still locked. Come on, stop fucking us! Ryan forces Langer back up the tower to pull the correct lever. Ryan runs back down to the open gate as Langer raises the alarm. It was a scene of high drama and anxiety on the part of prison officers. When prisoners are escaping, 
Nothing gets in their way. And unfortunately, they had repossession of an M1 carbine, automatic rifle. Then I looked up at the bloke in the tower's aiming at me. Well, it's very hard to put it in words. You know, it's, it's just actions in split seconds that are going off one after the other. Then George Hodson's materialised wherever he came from. Prison officer Hodson tackles Walker to the ground as Ryan attempts to hijack a passing car. Another guard, Robert Patterson, dashes out of the prison and takes aim at Ryan from behind. Ryan raises the carbine. A single gunshot rings out. The question of who fired the shots would plague the nation for decades to come. Ireland, February the 1st, 2001, eight miles outside Waterford on an isolated country road. Violent criminal Adrian Duke is being transported back to Cork Prison by unarmed guards in a hired van. The van was intercepted by um, a vehicle with masked and armed men forcing it off the road. Two men alighted from the intercept car, both of them wearing balaclavas. They smashed the front uh, windscreen and front driver's side of the window. They immediately demanded that uh, prisoner Adrian Duke be released. With no armour plating, bulletproof glass or security locks, the hired van is a soft target. They were making a statement clearly that they meant business. The guards are taken completely by surprise and are now under siege. The shouting, the banging, the smashing of the glass and the windscreen and the shouting to free, free him, let him go, let him go. And, you know, all that turmoil and confusion. The guards have no option. The man armed with a firearm pointed a firearm towards the prison officer and Adrian Duke was released. To the officers, the attack feels like an eternity, but the ambush takes less than 60 seconds. of the prison officers who were very traumatised by this. I, th I think it's important to remember them from, you know, that they have had effects from this, you know. As Adrian Duke celebrates his escape, he is unaware that the crew that pulled off the job to free him will also be his undoing. South Central Regional Jail, Charleston, West Virginia. A violent criminal, Robert Dale Shepard, is desperate to escape. His only way out, up and over a six metre high concrete wall through a roof made of chain link mesh. The plan, so simple, use a rope. I thought he was a fairly intelligent person. And uh, there again, they got 24 seven uh, to sit and think. Returning from solitary confinement, Shepard immediately scours the jail for vital materials. He comes to an extraordinary solution. You know, this requires you have dental care for inmates and that he was provided dental floss. Shepard calculates that seven packets of floss should make a rope long enough and strong enough to scale the six meter perimeter wall of the rec yard. Take dental floss and do it yourselves 300 feet in there. You got 20 feet high fence. Braid her up 10 times. You're going to make a knot it. You're going to make yourself a nice rope. Shepard bribes a prison trustee and gets a 10 centimetre hacksaw blade to cut through the chain link roof. But to use it, he needs to get back into isolation. He damages his cell by chipping away at the wall. And as planned, he's thrown in solitary for trying to escape. In the privacy of his new cell, he braids and weaves the floss into a rope, strong enough to carry his weight. It takes 48 hours for Shepard to weave his dental floss rope. He took advantage of things that uh, often happen to officers, as officer complacency about uh, pad searches, in order to move that rope from the cell to the rec yard. 
shepherd hides the rope by wrapping it around his genitals. The one place guards rarely pat down. The officers are like any other human being. Uh, they'll have reservations about placing their hands in someone's private parts, and that's where he was moving the rope back and forth from. How Shepard moved the hacksaw blade has never been revealed. Finally, after months of planning, Shepard, armed with his dental floss rope and hacksaw blade, has the wreck yard to himself. Well, he's in the wreck yard in an area of the wreck yard that you can't be seen via the camera. He knows the correctional officer's got other duties to perform. The breakout is good. He used a double-A battery uh, out of a Walkman. That is kind of a grappling hook of sorts. Using the battery as a weight, Shepard throws a line at the mesh above. But after 45 minutes of frustration, Shepard must return to his cell. After three agonizing days, Shepard finally makes the perfect throw. Slowly, he begins to scale the six-meter wall, pulling himself up the thin dental floss rope. Hanging from a thread, the pain grows as the dental floss cuts deep into his fingers. It's already taken him 20 minutes to get to the roof, and he still has to cut through the steel mesh above his head. Finally, Shepard is through the mesh and pulls himself up onto the roof. But he's not out yet. He crosses the roof and jumps to the ground, but still has the barbed wire perimeter fence to breach. Finally, outside the prison, Shepard dashes towards the forest. As he reaches the safety of the tree line, he stops and takes a look back. The jail is quiet. Robert Dale Shepard is free. Coming up. Police say that the two escapees are violent criminals made doubly dangerous by desperation. The biggest manhunt in Victoria's history. Because at that stage, we were sort of on hot bricks. And in Ireland, police close in on Adrian Duke. We had significant fears that he may be armed with a firearm. Pentridge Prison. Australia is in chaos. Two dangerous prisoners, Ronald Ryan and Peter Walker, have just escaped onto the street, armed with a rifle. 41-year-old prison guard, George Hodson, was attempting to recapture the escapees. He was unarmed. A single bullet ended his life. 39 witnesses, all testify that, you know, Ryan caused the, fired the shot. Well, I don't think Ryan shot at all. You don't think he fired a no, shot? not at all. See, the whole thing is that he'd been fooling around with the gun on the road because he left an, a live round of ammunition on the road. So that meant that there would have to have been something wrong with the gun. It was jammed or something like that. As Hodson lies bleeding to death, Ryan and Walker commandeer a getaway car and escape. Prison authorities give chase, but the escapees vanish. Police say that the two escapees are violent criminals made doubly dangerous by desperation. The biggest manhunt in Victoria's history is underway. Ryan and Walker go from hideout to hideout. As they become more desperate for money... Well, I must admit we were going to rob banks. There was, there was no way of getting around that. We certainly couldn't thumb a lift over to Brazil. We, we were just going to have to do it. And we did rob one. He herded them into the strong room, essentially, and told the staff that this was a weapon that had killed a man and that they needed to behave and do exactly what they were told. I walked into the bank to pay in some money and a young fellow bobbed up from the teller's desk and said, don't move or I'll shoot. I thought it was a good joke and I thought, what a funny Christmas joke. But then a, an elder man came from the vault where he just locked the staff in evidently and he said, yes, that's right, lady, we're the SPs and we're desperate. And he said, we definitely will shoot you. On Christmas Day, 1965, 24-year-old father of two, Arthur James Henderson, recognises the SPs and threatens to turn them in. 
I hit him with the gun. Uh, there was the explosion. He was dead. Now, I've come back and I've said to Ronald, look, I think he's dead. Well, I didn't know he was dead at the time. I thought he was, you know, um, because I didn't wait around. I don't think they can achieve much at all now. They've escaped convicts. There are two murders credited to them, and uh, I can't see what future there is before them at all. Parents were keeping their teenage children at home, uh, not allowing them to go to parties, uh, as there were numerous sightings of Ryan and Walker. On New Year's Day, the authorities receive a tip-off that Ryan and Walker are heading north to New South Wales. We figured that the easiest way maybe to get out would be to go the way that you'd be at least expected to go. And it was straight up the Hume Highway, right up through everything, through the middle of it, roadblocks or anything else that was in the way. Did Ryan ever talk to you about, if you were stopped, what you would do? Yeah, bail out and go like hell. That was what we said. We were very uh, determined to catch them and uh, return them to Victoria to get them to hell out of New South Wales because we have enough trouble here with our own criminals without them coming from either state. You still had a gun at the stage? Yeah, we were armed. Yeah. Yeah. Prepared to use? At that stage, I would say yes, because at that stage, we were sort of on hot bricks. Hello, is that the police? Yes, no, Ronald Ryan just came to my house. Then. On the 4th of January, the police have a breakthrough. They're tipped off that Ryan and Walker have arranged a double date with a couple of nurses. He said, will you get me a girlfriend so we could go out and have a good time? We then realised that they were in need of female company and probably they would be there. At 2.30pm on January the 5th, a team of 50 police officers begin to arrive in Hospital Road to set the trap for Ryan and Walker's arrival. They disconnect public phones and warn the owner of the shop across the road about Ryan and Walker's imminent arrival. They said, uh, you know, don't tell anyone. I said, no, I won't tell anyone, it's only me here. And uh, that's why I didn't tell the wife or anybody. I wasn't uh, really concerned, but I thought, he if I tell, my wife should probably get a bit upset. Undercover police officers escort the nurses to the designated meeting place. With the trap set, all the police can do now is wait. South Central Regional Jail, Charleston, West Virginia. Serving a life sentence, Robert Dale Shepard used a rope made from dental floss to scale the wreck yard wall to freedom. His daring breakout makes international headlines. Robert Shepard's face is splashed across newspapers and television screens. 33-year-old Robert Shepard escaped from the South Central Regional Jail just after midnight. Authorities say his method of escape, a homemade rope made out of dental floss. Big news, of course, is a local guy. And I told my wife, I said, I'd really like to catch this guy, you know. He's making a mockery of, of law enforcement, it felt like. How was Shepard able to escape without being noticed? Why was he not more closely supervised? Which gives rise to a third question, just how safe are the regional jails? The FBI, local sheriffs, and state police immediately launch a massive manhunt. We knew some places he had hung out up here. We knew places that uh, he had relatives, and we started checking those. We started asking people. We had people that was uh, the, looking for him that, that would turn him in, because there were some people that were real scared of him. Shepard has literally vanished. Law enforcement agencies chase every reported sighting from across the country. Authorities believe Shepard may have headed for the Parkersburg area after he made his escape. He's considered armed and dangerous. Police say they're worried about him being on the streets because of his violent nature. He had robbed a lot of pharmacies. He, he was a drug addict, and he admitted that. You know, he, he was addicted to drugs, so to feed his habit, he had to steal. Needing a fix, Shepard approaches a pharmacy in the small town of Mineral Wells. When I first looked up and he asked me if I was the pharmacist, 
I didn't want to believe it was him, so I thought, you know, this is just somebody that wants to wants me to look at a sore or, a, you know, a rash or something and make a recommendation. And he was holding a pillowcase, and he handed me the pillowcase. And when he handed me the pillowcase, he was holding a gun underneath of it. And he said, I'd like for you to put all of your narcs in this pillowcase. Natalie Wiggle begins to fill the pillowcase with painkillers and other narcotics. So, of course, at that time, I knew exactly who it was. And all I could think of was gun, gun, gun. Oh, my gosh, that's a gun. Fighting to keep calm, Natalie obeys Shepard's every order. I knew that he was capable of becoming very nasty very quickly. So uh, my main objective was to just give him what he wanted and get him out. As Natalie finishes filling the pillowcase, Shepard demands that she lie on the floor. We just had a two-year-old at that time, and I was working full-time, and after that, I haven't worked full-time since because it made me realize that my family was much more important than a job. As soon as Shepard is out of the door, Natalie Wiggle dials 911. By chance, Police Chief B.D. Atkins is only minutes away. We get a call that, you know, 10 or 15 minutes behind us, there was an armed robbery. And we just passed this Fruth Pharmacy in Mineral Wells, West Virginia. Well, we all turned around and started back that way. And when they gave the description of the red and white Ford truck, we thought, hey, that's our man. County Waterford, Ireland, February 2001. A prison van carrying armed robber Adrian Duke has been violently attacked, and a dangerous felon is now on the loose. Cork is better known for tourism than terror. The brutal attack on the van sends ripples of fear through the residents of quaint old County Cork. Um, at the time, it got an awful lot of local and national attention because of such an audacious attack on the prison van. And, um, an uh, attack like this hadn't taken place before. Don't move! Don't move! There was a, a responsibility on our behalf to, um, to have it investigated as quickly as we could. Adrian Duke has disappeared, and because of his violent criminal history, authorities fear the worst. Scissors to a security man's throat and threatened him and came into a shop wielding a hatchet, threatening staff there. There was this real fear that perhaps if he was uh, desperate and cornered, then he could have hurt people. But Duke's got his sights set on fleeing Ireland as soon as he can. His destination? Northern Europe. He had an association with um, a girl in Scandinavia, and he clearly made the decision that he was going to um, evade and abscond. Knowing Duke's intentions, the Gardaí go on full alert to prevent him from leaving the country. We had port and airport alerts both in Ireland and throughout Europol in, in relation to the circulation of description of Adrian Duke. Meanwhile, Duke's mates take him to a safe house. There, as part of his getaway plan, he's given new clothes and a new hair colour. We had to move very quickly on it. Um, because it, it was the gang's objective to get Adrian Duke out of the country as quickly as possible. Duke's plan seems to be on track, but then the police have a breakthrough. The getaway car has been found in a local car park. They were stupid in, in, in the way that the vehicle that they had used, you know, without even changing its plates or disguising it in any degree because the investigation just took off from the minute the car was found. The gang have made a critical error. By using a traceable vehicle as the getaway car, they've left a trail of clues for the police to follow. We were able to identify who had borrowed that, that car and it rolled on from there because we made a number of arrests, including the person who owned the car. At 10 p.m., armed police surround the house where they suspect Adrian Duke is hiding. We weren't sure whether Adrian Duke would actually be armed, but given the fact that a, a firearm was produced, we had significant fears that he may be armed with a firearm. So we had to deploy a firearms tactical team um, to basically surround the house. We entered through the front door of the premises and a number of um, the officers on the search entered a small bedroom at the rear of the uh, cottage and Adrian Duke was um, concealed under a bed um, in that actual bedroom. 
Considering his determination to evade imprisonment, Duke offers no resistance. He put his hands up and he was immediately um, secured and brought to the guard station. Adrian Duke was sentenced to 10 years for armed robbery, with an extra two years for his brutal escape attempt. Four local criminals each received two years for their part in the breakout. Duke has returned to Cork Prison, this time in a secure van with an armed escort. The Irish prison service are determined not to make the same mistake again. Coming up, the trap springs on Ryan and Walker. I've got no time for these murderous mugs. And next, a police chase through West Virginia. It's exciting, that's, that's why we do this work. The small town of Mineral Wells, West Virginia, is in a state of chaos. Escapee Robert Shepard has just pulled off an armed robbery at a pharmacy to feed his drug habit. When they gave the description of a red and white Ford truck, we thought, hey, that's our man. Police cars and deputies from all over the county are mobilized to stop the dental floss escapee. It's exciting, that's, that's why we do this work. That's the fun part. As police chase down Shepard's truck, he turns off the main road onto a dirt track into the forest. And it's a gravel road now, and it wasn't that good then, it was mostly dirt. And uh, he went out that road in the first bad curve, he went over in a real steep embankment. Unable to keep the truck on the road at such high speeds, Shepard smashes into the undergrowth. And I guess the truck got lodged between two trees. Stunned by the impact, Shepard bolts from the truck and disappears into the trees. Presuming that he is still armed, Sheriff Merritt and Chief Atkins begin a cautious search. Two kids, a boy and a girl, was walking up the road, and we, uh, I think it's BD asking, have you seen anyone? And the girl said, right over there, we just saw a guy run through the woods and said he had something in his hand. And as we backed up, I saw him over the embankment behind the barbed wire fence. He's up in here. She said he's up this way. Chief Atkins and Sheriff Merritt moved quickly to cover Shepard's position. You're real hyped when it happens, and, and you're focusing on one thing. There he is. We ran down the, the embankment and hollered. And, and I told Jay, I said, I said, if he moves, blow his brains out. And of course, me and my all my wisdom, I said, yeah, and I'll blow your head off too. And so. Everybody keep your hands in sight. Don't move them. Surrounded by armed police, Shepard surrenders. He was kind of a beaten individual right then. He was just, he was worn out. You know, he had run through the woods. It was a real hot day. He was sweating. He was just, he was just out of gas. He said, you don't know who you got. You don't know who you got. And I raised up his hat because I knew he was partially bald. I wanted to make sure. I said, I know who you are, Bobby. And he he seemed kind of shocked that we'd, we'd caught him. We were all proud that we had accomplished this by taking him into custody and uh, that was no gunfire, there was no one injured, that the people of Wood County and the, and the surrounding, everywhere was safe because we had another person off the streets that we felt was real dangerous. Shepard went straight back to serving his life sentence. Additionally, he was charged with escape and armed robbery. One of the first things that uh, he said when he returned to jail is that he would escape again, and he would do so within a short period of time. This brand new jail underwent a full security overhaul. We actually instituted a program on him where he was uh, continuously moved from cell to cell or searched uh, periodically so that he couldn't fulfill his uh, promise to escape again. Razor wire and tilt and pan security cameras were immediately installed. And not surprisingly, inmates were banned from the use of dental floss. In Sydney, Australia, the police have set an elaborate trap for armed and dangerous fugitives Ronald Ryan and Peter Walker. We had surveillance groups to be placed in Concord Road. 
in uh, unmarked police vehicles. We had police in various houses leading down Hospital Road. We had police inside and around the whole of the area there, and a group of about 10 of us whose task was, when they arrived, to arrest them. Ryan and Walker are due to rendezvous with two nurses at 9pm. But after 20 minutes, there's still no sign of the escapees, and police move the girls from the meeting point. Then, at 9.30, a surveillance crew spot the escapees heading towards the hospital. A car came round and swerved round into Hospital Road, driving at a fair bat, and was down at the hospital within a, a matter of uh, less than one minute. There was a scattered like you'd never seen of police around Hospital Road, as they all went back into their positions, so that when they arrived, it was a deserted scene. Ryan gets out of the car, can't see the women, so goes to use a payphone to call them. When it doesn't work, he enters Tom's shop. And he just said, can I use your phone, please? I says, yes, it's over there. So he used the phone, and uh, after he used the phone, he asked me how much it was, and I said, sixpence. And, and then he walked out, and as soon as he got onto the footpath, the, uh, the police just uh, grabbed him. Walker is still in the car when two unmarked police vehicles block him front and back. Ross Nixon immediately arrests him. We then uh, grabbed him and have assured that he came out of that car like a rocket. You look back at it and it's, it's almost like a play. In your mind, you're sort of not believing it's true, but you know that this is actually happening. And then you, you, you've got somebody sitting up there and he, he puts a piece of black cloth on his head and he, he sentences your, your friend to death. And... What was his attitude then? Shock? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I don't think we spoke any words. I you think we just grabbed each other's hand. How did you know he'd been sentenced to death? <laughs> he didn't tell you? No, he didn't have to. As soon as they said the, uh, you were guilty of murder, and I knew what, you know, was a death penalty. 30th of March, 1966. Ronald Ryan is found guilty of the murder of George Hudson and is sentenced to death by hanging. The decision prompts protests across the nation. I don't believe the death penalty was the answer. He only had 13 months from the beginning to the end to um, think about what, you know, his actions. But I've got no time for these murderous mugs who escaped and shot an innocent warder outside of the Pentridge Jail. Peter Walker is convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to 24 years for the deaths of Hodson and Henderson. He was released 19 years later on the 21st of December, 1984, and now lives in rural Victoria. At 8 a.m., on the 3rd of February, 1967, Ronald Ryan was executed. Here is a special news bulletin from the ABC's Melbourne newsroom. Ronald Joseph Ryan, 41, was hanged this morning at Pentridge Jail for the murder of the warder, George Hodson. His body is buried at Pentridge Prison. Ronald Ryan was the last man to be hanged in Australia. We've got the rest of our lives, which is 40 odd years down the track. We're still, um, we're still paying the price for his actions. I remember him as a, a good bloke, a good friend, a man who could have done a lot better for this world if he was alive than he is now dead. After Ryan's death, capital punishment was abolished in Australia. A few days before he died, Ryan wrote these final words. It is an often repeated thought of mine that we could each do with two lifetimes on this earth. Then we could benefit from our mistakes and live closer to the Ten Commandments. Next time, a desperate prisoner pulls off a Houdini-style escape. There's the, the cornered rat, you know, the man who, who had to get away come what may. In Britain, a mass breakout from maximum security spills out onto the streets. They've got maps, 
guns, everything he really needed to escape. And in America, a murderous gang bust out of prison, leaving chaos in their wake. The manhunt for the Texas 7 was the largest I saw in my 23 years in the FBI.